Ladies and gentlemen, Chaplain Jeffrey Ross, United States Navy, will now offer the invocation. Let us pray. Lord, I want to thank you for your presence with us today. As we gather these next few days to focus on U.S. maritime superiority, awed by the awesome power and might of human ingenuity and our collective grit, let us be reminded of your power and might. Guide us in our decisions with the wisdom of Solomon and grant us the strength to be the moral, ethical leaders of character you call us to be. Continue to bless the Navy League and its cadre of volunteers and all that they do as they continue to support our Navy's sea services, the Navy, the Marines, the Coast Guard, and the Merchant Marines. We ask your protection on those currently deployed, underway, in harm's way, or standing the watch. Protect them from both the enemies that seek to destroy the body, but also the enemy that seeks to destroy the soul. Send your angels to watch over their families as they faithfully await their return. In your holy and heavenly name I pray, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the CEO of the Navy League of the United States and 13th Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, Mike Stevens. All right. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Please have a seat. Thank you, Chaplain. So uh, was yesterday a good day? Everybody have a good time? Your feet okay? Did you get a chance to get your feet rested last night? Yeah. Who won the basketball game last night? Right. So wasn't day one phenomenal? Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our second day of sea air space. And looking through today's schedule, we're locked and loaded for another unforgettable day. I just wanna make a couple of admin notes here. Uh, we have a wonderful outside exhibit this year. We have about 70 exhibits out by the waterfront. We encourage everybody to go out there and spend some time uh, with that. And also we have uh, two receptions and one of them is gonna be in the Maryland ballroom. So we have the one down on the main floor and then we have one here in the Maryland ballroom and we have exhibitors in there as well. And we ask that you take the opportunity to, um, to spend some time in both those locations. Well, thank you for joining us bright and early for this marquee event, the Navy League Center for Maritime Strategy Breakfast. This is the center's third year of operating as the world's, and I mean that, world's premier maritime think tank, led by our very own Admiral Jamie Fogo, Fogo the Dean of the Center for Maritime Strategy. Each year, this breakfast convenes leading members of the maritime community to engage in critical discussions in the maritime domain. This year's panel tit titled Innovation and Technology, a Force Multiplier for Sea Power, will address the multifaceted efforts from the Navy and defense industry in advancing sea service capabilities for the modern fleet. I have a little piece here where I'm gonna introduce Admiral Fogo, but Admiral Fogo, give me just one second here because I wanna say something. So we are so blessed to have Admiral Fogo as the Dean of the Center for Maritime Strategy. He's a very unique Naval officer. And I got a chance to witness that firsthand last week. Due to some unforeseen circumstances, we were down quite a few people on the CMS staff and Admiral Fogo was hosting an event. It was a book signing event for, for Admiral Stavridis. And I watched Admiral Fogo go to Whole Foods shopping for finger food and poo-poos and biscuits and things like that. And he brings it in and he sets it up himself. He's got some help from a couple of people, but he was down there working. I told him the other day, I saw him working like a deck seaman on that day. He had his sleeves rolled up. And then when the event was over, of course, he's a gracious host, the event's over. Then he stays down there and cleans it up. And he's working with our property managers to get the conference room set up. At the end of the day, it was pretty late. He comes up to my office and he goes, pretty good event, Mike. What he didn't know is his tie was kind of crooked. I think one collar was up. You know, he, his hair was a little disheveled. And I said to him, sir, you must have been a hell of a junior officer. I tell you what, down in the bilge cleaning up. And, and that's why his sailors love him. 
when I was the mass chief of the Navy and I got a chance, he was still on active duty. Every sailor that I talked to absolutely loved serving with him. And I got a chance last week to understand why. So we are so fortunate to have him as the Dean of the Center for Maritime Strategy. That's my introduction, Admiral Fogo. So please come on up and join me. <laughs> Very kind of you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, there can't be any better way to start the day than with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance and the Star Spangled Banner. Yesterday I was on the dais with uh, Joanne Burdian, uh, who is a Rear Admiral in the United States Coast Guard, and we were talking about uh, bringing Baltimore back. And uh, not soon enough, uh, tragedy occurs, and that's what we do as Americans, and I'm proud to be up here as an American today in front of you. So thanks for that introduction, Mike, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third year of the Center's existence in our third panel. Before I introduce the panelists and take a seat, I'd like to uh, thank the sponsors of this event today, uh, probably more sponsors than we've ever had, which means that uh, the folks we've invited <coughs> up today are the right ones. So thank you to Kerasoft, Elbit Systems of America, Ernst & Young, General Atomics, Jonathan Engineered Solutions, L3 Harris, Lidos, Lockheed Martin, Navy Mutual, Northrop Grumman, and Ultra Marine. Couldn't do this without your support. And on our website throughout the year are listed all of our other sponsors, many of whom are here today. And so thank you for your support. I'm gonna go ahead and take my seat and then we'll get on with the show. We have one hour of discussion. I will try to work in some questions so all of you can have an opportunity to talk to our guests. So ladies and gents, as I said, this is the third annual uh, CMS breakfast, and I laud all of you for being early risers today. Apologize for the time getting in here at seven o'clock in the morning, but uh, certainly a lot of level of interest based on the crowd that we have. Let me just recap for the last couple of years. In 2022, um, my guests on this day were Dr. Mara Carlin, uh, Admiral Poppy Paparo, before of course he becomes uh, Indo-PACOM here shortly, uh, Lieutenant General Karsten Heckel, Marine Corps Combat Development Command, my former Chief of Staff at uh, Strike Force NATO, and Mitch Waldman, who was out here, and we were reminiscing about that. It was a great panel, and it dived into uh, the department's new policy of integrated deterrence. Last year, uh, we had Dr. Bill LaPlante, who is um, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment. Accompanying him, uh, Admiral Chris Grady, the Vice Chairman. Uh, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, Eric Smith and uh, former ASNRDA Hondo Gertz. <coughs> Dr. LaPlante uh, wowed the crowd with uh, one quote, and that was at the end when he said, the answer to our problems is procurement, procurement, procurement. I know the industrial base loved that. Admiral Grady talked about Joint Warfighting 3.0, General Smith, deterrence, and Hondo, the public-private partnership between industry. <coughs> all of these gentlemen and all of you uh, in order to make uh, this nation strong in light of all the threats we have out there, the Chinese, the Russians, the Iranians, the axis of resistance, the Houthis, the North Koreans, and violent extremist organizations. So today, uh, I'm really happy to be able to introduce our first guest, the Honorable Nicholas Gurton, who was sworn in as Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Research Development and Acquisition in December of 2023, so he hadn't been there that long, but he knows what he's doing because he's been around town and he's been in uh, the building for a very long time. He's also one of us, a retired Navy Reserve engineering duty officer, and he's had an extensive four decade combined military and civilian career in submarine operations, ship construction, maintenance, development, testing, weapons, sensors, and combat management projects. Prior to this job, uh, he served as the Director of Operational Tests and Evaluation as the Senior Advisor to the Secretary of Defense on these new weapon systems and platforms that we've put out there, a la shock test on the carrier. And sir, uh, you know, I was down on the watch floor 
during STEM day. We had 4,000 kids here for STEM day on uh, Sunday. And I was out there in my jeans doing things with these kids. I mean, HII did a wonderful job. I watched uh, some kid who was a welder make his first pass, get a 58%. Brian Treat, one of your welders, co coached him on his second pass, 85%. That's good for an apprentice. I mean, it's amazing what artificial intelligence and things can do. Kid told me, you have just written uh, the preface for the largest journal of the American Society of Naval Engineers and contributed to you know, how we're gonna continue and possibly improve operational tests and evaluation. And then he showed it to me, so really commendable. I don't know how you, how you have time to do all that, but uh, welcome, sir. Hey, people. <laughs> your, your job is enormous. Uh, you're the Navy's acquisition executive. You report to Congress on all matters of uh, policy and programs. You are the Milestone ACAT 1C authority, so you're writing the checks, and you recommend on the big programs ACAT 1D to SecDef. You're also in charge of uh, the Office of Naval Research, and I don't know if Gucci Clunder's out there, but he and I were battle buddies in the Pentagon when he had that job. This is a huge job, and so uh, you've been in it for a little over three months now, sir. How's it going? Well, thank you for that introduction, entirely too generous. Um, well, it's going especially, honestly, this is a job that I am just over the moon to have. Yeah. A great opportunity, but um, it's also a tremendous in its scope and scale. But fortunately, I've got a great team around me, um, <clears throat> the deputy assistants, the PEOs, the program managers. Um, no, this is not a job for someone on an island. This is a big team job. And working with industry is uh, the things that, one of the things that I can do uniquely in that position is make sure that <coughs> that bridge between government and industry is open and fast and we can have those conversations and make sure that we're doing the right thing for uh, the Navy and the Marine Corps in, in building the systems they need to um, keep our nation safe. Um, I would have to say that after three months, I've gotten a, a little bit used to the rhythm um, and it's, it's now it's, it's time to start um, working with uh, the, that bigger team of government and industry to think about how do we do this work even better. Outstanding, sir. Uh, we got a lot of challenges, and uh, you and I talked in advance about one of my uh, favorite recent books, and that is uh, Arthur Herman's <coughs> Freedom's Forge. And folks, if you hadn't had a chance to pick this up, uh, it's an incredible book about the arsenal of democracy in World War II. And uh, two guys, William Knudsen, the automobile magnate, General Motors, and Henry Kaiser. Uh, Kaiser Shipbuilding. Now, uh, President Roosevelt during the war decided that he needed some help. And if you can imagine in the 21st century, the president picks up the phone and calls uh, Fortune 500 company CEO and says, hey, get down to Washington. I'm gonna pay you a dollar a year and you're gonna reform my acquisition system. You're gonna build the uh, arsenal of democracy. By the end of World War II, we had, according to this book, 55 shipyards, East Coast, West Coast, Gulf Coast. And when the Reagan administration came in and picked Cap Weinberger as SecDef, 19 shipyards. Today, seven. So, sir, you've got some challenges. And uh, the last administration laid down a marker of 355 ships. Uh, today, our end strength is below 300 ships. So, how are you going to take this challenge on in the next few years as ASNRDA? And let me just go one step further and ask you, is it uh, time to call for the Defense Production Act in acquisition of warships? <clears throat> Fantastic question. Actually, this is not a new book. I read this one several years ago. Glad you finally caught up. <laughs> um, but the, uh, one of the things that's really important, I think, and that is it's about setting conditions. The president saw the need to ramp up the need to build ships, not just for us, but really for all freedom-loving nations in the 30s well in advance of having a kinetic um, environment that which we would uh, step into and stand tall. So um, setting conditions is a big part of the things that I can do with the administration and with industry um, and to identify some of the <coughs> things that you brought up about how we are, um, we, we have many fewer shipyards than we've had in the past. Uh, there needs to field capability into the fleet to conquer the tyranny of distance and deliver uh, war fighting game changing capability um, is something that will require more players on the field in industry and government in order to have more players on the field for the chief of naval operations. 
So I'm, uh, when I went through my confirmation hearing, I was sitting next to the uh, now Assistant Secretary of Defense for um, Manpower and Reserve Affairs. And uh, the, the Chairman Reed said, the two of you guys are in competition with each other. You both need more people. But I need more people in, on the waterfront and in the laboratories and in the production lines. Uh, not too long ago, I was uh, city, I went to uh, Groton for the christening of the USS Idaho. It was the first time I had a chance to do that. All right. Uh, Sean Stackley's out in the, uh, here in the audience. His wife right was there. a sponsor. She did a fantastic job. She had a little warm-up act there, and she, <laughs> she did not have to hit it twice, I'll tell you that. Um, <clears throat> anyway, but bef the day before that, I went to my sister's high school, and I brought with me two different kinds of recruiters. Uniformed recruiter, a great first class petty officer, and a recruiter from Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. And I talked to my sister's high school about how there's plenty of work in industry for people who want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. So I need to recruit, I'm, of course, I'm certainly concerned about um, you know, hitting our recruiting goals for the uniform, and to the extent that I can be helpful at it, I, I will, but I've, I've got a really big problem in getting people to turn wrenches, run weld beads, and think about how we build ships differently. So I, I'm going to, I br brought my own discussion artifact. All right. Uh, at the risk of teasing your question out too far. Uh, a few years ago, um, when I was the Navy's open architecture guy, thanks again to Mr. Stackley for giving me an opportunity to carry that through. Um, I was counseled to read this book, The Box, by Mark Levison. It chronicles um, somebody who looked at themselves in the mirror and saw something different. Malcolm McLean looked at himself in the mirror and did not see a trucking company owner. He saw a getting stuff to other places owner. And he had this great idea of taking the, track, the trailer part of a tractor trailer and putting on uh, the deck of older Liberty ships who, that he could buy for practically nothing because it was post it was in the early 50s, so post-World War II. We still had a lot of uh, excess um, transport capacity on the ocean. And so he needed to get stuff from the Northeast to the Gulf <coughs> Coast, and he brought them around by ships, and that was tremendously disruptive. Ultimately, we end up with the ISO shipping container and the distribution of uh, production all across the planet. Perhaps it's time, now I'm not the requirements guy, I'm the acquire guy. Validated requirement, money in the budget, out of my way we're gonna go build stuff. That's my job. But for the people who are thinking about what kind of weapon systems and delivery capabilities we need in the future, we need to start looking ourselves in the mirror and seeing not destroyer men or uh, carrier people or submariners, but as delivering game-changing capability across the tyranny of distance. That's our business. And we should start thinking about that business differently so that we can ramp up our ability to do that work that we see ourselves in the mirror for in a, in a way that will get us to the volume of capacity that we're gonna need in the future. Outstanding. Now, uh, you and I have something in common with Carnegie Mellon. I was up there last summer to <coughs> promote the uh, ensigns and second lieutenants in the graduating class. I was invited by Audrey Kurth Cromanen, who is the daughter of Admiral Kurth, was at War College for, uh, when I was a young pup growing up, and then her husband, Patrick Cronin, and we did a webinar on uh, life in the submarine force. It was great. Now, you did some uh, research up there for government and academia and software reliant and cyber physical systems. So we had a panel yesterday, it was spectacular. Admiral Thomas is out here, who's on that panel, uh, sponsored by HII on CJADC2. Uh, was there anything there that, that you came upon or that you're doing now that would facilitate uh, combined joint all domain command and control? Certainly, actually, I've been working in technology standards for quite some time, and while I was at Carnegie Mellon, it was a, it was a weird fit. I wasn't really one of these super deep researching software experts on a particular method or technology or, or uh, uh, systems engineering process. I was more of a acquirer, uh, bind people together guy. They needed that, it was, um, but every once in a while I would wake up in a cold sweat, they're gonna figure me out, I'm not really a club member. But, but it, was, it was a great partnership. But one of, one of the things I was able to do while I was there was carry forward some of the uh, concepts I've been working with ac across the naval enterprise about how do we 
break up these big problems into smaller pieces and then iterate and improve over time as a natural consequence. It's something we just do every day. I, every once in a while, I have a program manager who's working on a software project and I'll say, when are you gonna be done upgrading that? And they get the right answer if they say never. So we need to be thinking about the play payloads that go into our platforms as things that are ever changing. Not hourly or weekly, like what happens in our cell phones, but at the right cadence for the kinds of technology. You don't want to upgrade weapons unless you've gone through the triple STRP and the WeSERB and you know, can know you can safely employ munitions. So that's not going to be like hourly or monthly, even monthly, it might be annually, but that would be fast enough. So we need to be thinking about the cadence of improvement for our warfighting capability as a natural consequence. When I was at dot and &E, I helped the team create a strategy and then an impl implementation plan against that strategy. And the core element of that strategy was, how do we test weapon systems that are built to change over time as their value proposition to the warfighter? And that was hard for them to take on. They were used to a very waterfall approach to, um, I start with a set of requirements, I build to, a, I, I design to a decomposition, I integrate those things back up and I test the requirement. But what if the requirement changes and how do I do that as a part of the natural consequence? So using some alternative developmental methods like DevOps, like Agile, and how do we apply those appropriately and artfully to our mission systems is a big part of what I was able to bring out of that experience into this new role. Hey, that's terrific. Now, I've got a question on uh, submarines. I'm going to reserve that for uh, Matt's discussion, sir, and ask you to weigh in then. But the last thing, we've got a lot of folks out here in the industrial base. What do you need from industry to help? Wow. Um, I, well, first of all, I am so grateful to be able to have uh, great partners with industry. Um, I think that one of the things we need to think seriously about, though, is how do we look at the people that you all employ to building our uh, weapon systems of um, force sailors and marines as national strategic assets that the people out on the waterfront running weld beads or pulling cable or on the production lines assembling components that they're part of something huge and we just need more of them uh, we need uh, investment in the capacity and in helping and uh, creating environments where people want to stay at work. As we did the 45 day study, thank you for not bringing that up. <laughs> um, the, uh, one of the things we found is that um, attracting and retaining uh, workers in the production facilities is much harder now than it's been in the past. You know, COVID really happened. The greening of the workforce really happened. It's had an impact all up and down the portfolio. So quality of work for industry is a matter of first priority. And if you start thinking about your national strategic asset of the people who build our systems and that their happiness at work is a primary task for industry so that you can hang on to them, so you can keep them where we need them building these systems. We're bleeding people on the waterfront and we need to turn that around. Outstanding, sir. Message heard loud and clear. Uh, let's shift gears and move next door to Admiral Daryl Cottle, one of my uh, favorite naval officers. Daryl's a graduate of North Carolina State University, 1985, magna cum laude in chemical engineering. Go Wolfpack. <laughs> He's currently our U.S. Fleet Forces Command Commander. Prior to that, he was the commander of the submarine force. And prior to that, I was lucky enough to have him on my staff as the commander of submarine group eight in Naples, Italy. And uh, we had a ball. Uh, Daryl commanded three submarines. The first was Jefferson City, the normal chain of events where an officer works his way up and earns command of a submarine. And then two other boats that were in trouble when he was a squadron deputy. So, you know, when there's a spill on aisle 10, call Daryl and he'll come and clean it up and get those, uh, those folks back on track. Uh, he's also brilliant. He's got two master's degrees and a PhD in uh, leadership studies, but with a focus on cyber C2. So I couldn't think of a better guy to be leading Fleet Forces Command. Now, Daryl, I heard your incredibly powerful speech, and uh, you were like a preacher at the pulpit 
at the Surface Navy Association. <laughs> and you've got energy, you've got stamina, and you got a lot to say. You talked about a global maritime response plan, a way to shift the Navy from peacetime to wartime. And you know, I think we're there. I think we're in phase two. I mean, we're shooting down uh, drones and missiles in the Red Sea. We're active all over the world. We're being contested in waters that uh, we've normally been able to sail through. And you also said that you were confident that we're ready to meet requirements of the IRF, the Intermediate uh, Immediate Response Force, but not the CRF, the Contingency Response Force, which are required to flow in 30 days. And you had some ideas on that. You mind elaborating a little bit for what you're doing and how you're getting after this problem for the audience? So Jamie, thanks for having me. Thanks for moderating this panel and thanks for our friendship and thanks to the Navy League and our corporate sponsors for hosting this. It's really an opportunity for me to be able to come as the Fleet Forces uh, Commander. You know, U.S. Fleet Forces, I think, uh, has a, an incredibly unique position in the Navy to sit at the nexus of what our CNO's three tenets are, and that's warfighting, warfighters, and the foundation that supports those three uh, things. And so at Fleet Forces, you know, from the, from the warfighting perspective, you know, I get to lead the doctrine, I get to lead readiness, I get to lead the innovations in logistics, and, and certainly what we're doing in the shore. And then for the war fighters, I am the quality of service, I think, commander who's working for the, the, uh, the programs and initiatives that are building out quality of life and quality of work. Of course, defining what mission command looks like and making sure that we're delivering. And then in the foundation, to make sure that our budget to outcome ratio is on the right side of our return on investment. Uh, working with academia and industrial partners to deliver everything that the secretary just talked about. So I look forward to any questions along that line. I would make three points because this is about innovation. And uh, the first one is innovation, when most people hear that, they think about gadgets. You know, they think about a piece of hardware, something you can acquire. But we also have to innovate in force generation and the policy that governs how we generate force to maximize our readiness. So at the heart of that, it is the work we're doing on the Global Maritime Response Plan. And at the heart of that, it's defining what combat surge readiness looks like. And I'll come back to that point in just a minute. The second point I would make is there's a need to improve senior leaders in the Department of Defense, certainly in the Navy, and educate them on these innovative concepts. A lot of times I hear the buzzwords thrown around, AI or ML, quantum, directed energy, and there's no coupling of those concepts to the problems that they actually solve. You know, quantum computing has a very discrete class of problems it solves. And people think it's faster or better, but no, it doesn't run Word, okay? You don't start <laughs> Microsoft Office with it. And so, you know, the, the class of problems that these things solve <coughs> need to be clearly defined so that we mainstream and can actually apply at the department's level of leadership where those types of technologies need to land. So that's an education campaign. And then the last one is, I get a lot of briefs on concepts of operations that are cartoons. You know, the team will come into my office, they show me a little cartoon, it's got this little beautiful description of these things flying around, and you know, and they're doing things in a, in a weapons engagement zone, it's penetrating, and it's got all these command and control little lightning bolts, and it's cartoon D. But at the end of the day, it's people like me that have to turn concepts of operations into, into concepts of deployment, Jamie. It's how we actually deploy it. And so, you know, I'll work with the program managers on what we call the historical tale of a program to make sure that the parts are there, the training's there. But it's really the, you know, how do I get this capability that we're trying to move at pace into the theater? Where is it staged? Where is the accessing, basing, and overflight? you know, characteristics. Right. How do I put that into our normal OFRP? So that work has to be done in what I'm calling the concept of deployment. That's an extremely important part of that conversation. So let me just say one part about the Global Maritime Response Plan. It, it became pointedly obvious to CNO Franchetti that the Navy that she will have during her tenure as the CNO will not fundamentally change in size. It just will not. And it will not, with the ordinate stockpiles that she has, will not fundamentally change in size. The number of people and the shortages of folks we have, gaps at sea, all those challenges will not fundamentally change. So we have a responsibility to wring out every ounce of readiness we can to be ready to match these pure adversaries. And we see what's going on in the Red Sea today. 
it's the training, it's the alert watch standard, it's the way we posture and everything we build into our tactical units that, uh, that is delivering those successes and those winning uh, strategies there in the Red Sea. So we have to be able to scale that. Traditionally, the OFRP is great for global force management, everyday presence requirements. It will generate it, what it generates in peacetime. But how do I put that on steroids so that units of force in our Navy don't move through the OFRP as a zero, and then once they're finished with Comp 2X, they become a one? Mm -hmm. We have to do better than a zero or a one. And so this idea of improving training density uh, defining what being combat surge ready is. So if called, I can flow a force into the theater and make sure that there is a, a, a crew and a ship material readiness that is at an acceptable level of risk that it can integrate into any combat schema maneuver with confidence and can be employed to add mass and fires density into that existing structure that may be there like a, a carrier strike group. So uh, this idea of response plans and putting the Navy at battle stations through tiered response readiness levels is key to that plan. So if you think day to day, I'm operating in like RESCON, I call it response yeah. condition five. The OFRP does its normal thing. And as I get indications of warning of hostilities where competition starting to turn into conflict and perhaps crisis, we increase our response condition and that may look different for different communities of practice, okay? To ensure that everyone's ready to flow their force so that flowing the tip fit is just not, again, a buzzword. There has to be an underpinning of that. Now, we will naturally think that deals with the submarine force or our surface navy or air wings, but this is NAVC. You know, how does NAVC get on a wartime footing to be prepared to conduct repairs and dry dockings at pace, contracting, what are the contracting vehicles that need to be standing ready to actually get this moving at pace? You know, what are the authorities that need to be pushed down to allow me to do things like rearm at the pier when I normally have to go to Yorktown to be outside the explosive arc that won't be able to be done at pace if I go stack up ships at Yorktown? So all that's being planned out and thought through so that we put <coughs> some teeth into what it means to be ready to flow our force. Daryl, very articulately said, I think, uh, easy for everybody to understand the challenges and the things you're doing about it. And by the way, I got a note from uh, one of my old mentors in his 80s now, uh, Captain Jay Highland. Uh, he had a reunion of his submarine down in Norfolk, one of the old 41 for freedom. And he wrote me a note to say, hey, this guy Cottle came and spoke to us veterans. There were probably 40 of them there and their wives and how much he appreciated you taking time out of your schedule. That means a lot. And, and that's the quality guy you are. So thanks for that. Hey, two years ago at SNA, you talked about ordinance, and you mentioned it just a minute ago, and uh, and then you did something about it. Uh, you actually sat down with industry, and you listened uh, to the challenges, and you're working with them to try to come up with a plan in public-private partnership. This thing that uh, Hondo Gertz talked about last year. So, uh, you know, with the Red Sea situation, I don't think we're getting out of that anytime soon. Uh, and so we're gonna have an ordinance challenge. And as the fleet forces commander, I know people are leaning on you. Um, what's the future look like in the inventory of the magazine? Yeah, I had mixed reviews on me fussing at industry at that SNA, I can assure you. Uh, uh, but you know, it's, a, it's really, I call it a backhanded compliment of my expectation of the defense industrial base to be able to do exactly what we're talking about here is they have to go to battle stations too with us. Yeah. And uh, they are great partners and uh, there's no shortage of that. And so I work very closely with Admiral Morley to bring in partners to, to try to understand what they need from us uh, as they work through some of the challenges that are remnants of COVID and supply chain and everything else that we, we talk about. Um, and so what is it do I think that I have a responsibility to do? Well, I think it's setting very well-defined crisp requirements. You know, I get that a lot that, you know, requirements creep, we start a, you know, a program of record and we change our mind and, you know, it's not an executable requirement. So we have to be very good at, at requirement setting. I think we have to be very good at contract strategy so that there's accountability and visibility and I don't get backed into a corner of an underperforming contract when I don't have any degrees of freedom to go change and do something about it. I think it's making sure that to the extent we can, we give clear signaling of the demand signal through multi-year procurement. 
you know, so that the risk that a company wants to put into that is bought down because it's obvious that we're going, we're in this for the long game. Yeah. So, and then the last thing is the in situ processes of generating a weapon off the assembly line, if you will, we interface with that. There's quality assurance checks, there's testing requirements, there's uh, critical uh, procedures that are used. We have a responsibility to keep that part of our responsibility updated and, and, and streamlined so that we're not in the critical path of a defense industrial partner's ability to generate that. Well, you know, uh, there's a lot of guys that, that I mentored and I love. I mean, Rob Goucher's one of them out there and is just doing great things as your submarine force commander. You know Mike Beer, and uh, Mike is Commander Mike Beer now. He started with me as Lieutenant Mike Beer, three times a by name call out in uh, Europe and as Director of Navy Staff. So Mike's the CEO of the USS Chafee. So I called him up, I actually saw him in San Diego for West. I said, hey Mike, there's a lot of discussion out there about the trade-off between an SM2 and a $2,000 drone. As a commanding officer, what do you think? He looked at me and he goes, sir, you've known me for a long time. What do you think the cost of failure is? And what do you think those COs are gonna do? Yeah. They're gonna shoot the damn SM2. And I'm like, I'm with you, brother. So we have a responsibility to get them the weapons they need and uh, to be able to do the mission, which they are doing magnificently, by the way. Well, well Jamie, I'll just finish with just saying, um, we want our surface Navy, and I was talking with my table about this, to be offensive. That's the goal of combat ships, is to Absolutely. stick it to the enemy, okay? That's what <laughs> yeah. we do. And when I'm burning VLS cells by defense to defend, then I'm not bringing to bear the main battery in an offense. So we have got to look at different solutions that allow us to take down some of this defensive, you know, countermeasure type of shots in a more, uh, a less expensive, more effective and reloadable manner. Of course, people think directive energy, all I had flank on that, you know, yep. I've been talking about yep. since I got my degree in Monterey <laughs> in 92, all the way to more inexpensive missile systems that we can reload more easily. So all that's got to go so we keep the main battery offensive. That's a perfect segue into our next guest, Daryl. Thank you very much. And our next guest is Mr. Doug Beck, Director of Defense Innovation Unit. He oversees efforts to accelerate the department's adoption of commercial technology through the military and also serves as a senior advisor to the Secretary of Defense, Deputy Secretary of Defense. Before uh, taking on this awesome responsibility, Doug was a vice president at Apple and a direct report to Apple CEO, Tim Cook. You see him on TV all the time. Uh, he's currently a captain in the Navy Reserve. He served in Iraq and Afghanistan from 2006 to 2007. He holds a bachelor's degree summa cum laude from Yale and a master's in philosophy in international relations from Oxford where he was a Rhodes Scholar. And you guys know what that means. Doug, you've had an incredible life. Welcome to the dais today. And uh, eight years ago, we talked uh, beforehand, we both knew uh, Dr. Ash Carter. He was a adjunct professor of public policy at the Kennedy School when I was there, and I loved Ash Carter. Eight years ago, he formed DIUX. It's gone through some transitions to DIU 1.0, Defense Innovation Unit 1.0, Build the Bridge, DIU 2.0, Prove the Model, Prototype, and the current day, which is you, Doug, DIU 3.0. And your perspectives here, it's online, it's free, it's really, really good. Uh, and this is how you leverage the best of commercial technology and innovation uh, for our military. So uh, first question to you is, could you please tell us how you got involved in DIU, uh, what impact and influence the late great uh, Secretary Carter had on you vis-a-vis uh, -vis your new role and how you see this evolution from DIUX to 3.0, over to you. Well, uh, first of all, thank you so much for, uh, for having me here today and thank you the Navy League uh, both for, uh, for giving me an opportunity to be up here and also for your incredibly important work that, uh, that you do for our people um, across Naval Services. Um, so it's an honor to be here with all my hats on. Um, I, you know, I really come at this set of problems with, with uh, three lenses. I've uh, been, apartment for, been at the department for almost a year. As you said, I was at Apple for about 13 years, spent nearly 27 years uh, the Navy, most of my career living and working in OPACOM. Uh, in various ways, and I had the privilege to be at the inception of DIU then X, um, first as a civilian advisor to Secretary Carter and uh, then Vice Chairman Admiral Winnefeld, um, and then they yanked me out of my reserve job to, um, 
to lead the joint reserve component of DIU X uh, and then DIU kind of for its, its first four years from inception. And, um, you know, Secretary Carter was truly prescient in seeing that we must leverage, we must leverage uh, the incredible capability that's resident in our, in our commercial uh, tech sector in order to meet the strategic imperative fa facing the nation. He saw that back in 2014, 15, as uh, DIUX was being uh, stood up. Um, he saw that uh, in, in where the People's Republic of China was going, as well as the other threats around the world. Um, and what he saw was that um, in, in so many areas of technology, in 11 of the 14 areas that we track uh, as a department, things like artificial intelligence, autonomy, biotech, uh, space, uh, cyber and telecoms, um, et cetera, um, those areas of tech are going faster in order to meet the relentless demands of billions of consumers around the world uh, and the enterprises that serve them, probably always will, um, than they possibly could in our bespoke uh, defense-only pathways, which means that we've got to be able to take full advantage of that as well as the unique capabilities of our bespoke pathways, put those two things together in order to generate the capability that we need to meet, the, to meet that imperative. Now, we are at a, a tipping point now um, where uh, we, you know, Secretary Carter got that, um, and we're now uh, way past where we were there. We've got a, at a tipping point where we have a, uh, a president, a secretary, a deputy secretary who get it, a commercial tech sector who get it, um, a, uh, a Congress who uh, gets it, um, and partners across the, uh, the, the, uh, the leadership of the department who get it. And Secretary Carter really saw that and to your question, first of all, he kind of got me started in this, uh, in this space in a lot of ways at, that, at this intersection of the worlds in which I live. But he also, and you and I talked about this a little bit, um, when I was thinking about, um, about coming to do this, um, you know, he, um, just a few weeks before he passed, um, he was pushing me uh, that, uh, that I had to come into the department and do this. And he, he called me and he said, you know, Doug, there's one word why it's time for you to come do this. And the word is duty. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, he had a point. Um, so uh, here I am. So back to the imperative. As you said, you know, DIU 1.0 was really about building the bridge between these two worlds. And back then, the metric was could, if we, could, how many meetings could we have? And if we even had a meeting, would anybody show up or see any value in being there and the, from either side? And the answer too often was no. Um, and then DIU 2.0 is about proving that you could take a real military problem, commercial technology, bring them together, use authorities we already had on the books, and get a prototype into the hands of the warfighter and do it weeks or months, not five or ten years. And we've now proven that a ton of times at DIU as well as in a number in all the other organizations around <coughs> the department. Um, we can execute, and that is great, but to the Admiral's point, that is not good enough. Because what we have to do now is take that capability and apply it for strategic effect. And that really means two things. First, it means that we've got to focus it on solving those most critical problems that we must solve to deter major conflict or win if we are forced to fight. And then we've got to do the hard work of working with, uh, with the services and with our partners across the department in order to scale those capabilities so that they can actually deliver that strategic effect because a prototype doesn't, right? And so that is what DIU 3.0 is about. That's why Secretary Austin elevated DIU to be a direct report. That's why I messed up my perfectly good life to come uh, join the team full time and uh, why I'm proud to be up here uh, with the rest of the team. Hey, well, I'm glad that uh, Secretary Carter talked you into that and uh, we don't have time to tell some of the other great stories you and I were comparing notes on the other day, but what a, what a terrific man and what a great loss to the nation. So that brings me to uh, the next question about DIU. Uh, can we talk about Replicator? There's a lot in the press about it. We've read that uh, DevSecDef Cat Hicks has down-selected some uh, prototypes. Um, it's seven or eight months in, uh, in some uh, circles, like my friend and your friend, uh, Long Aquilino, it's referred to as future hellscape, overwhelming the enemy with drones. Uh, can you enlighten us as to where we are and how this is going? Sure, so, um, so Replicator really is about two things. First, it is about uh, solving a critical need for Indo-PACOM 
um, for Admiral Aquilino and Admiral, Admiral Paparo, first as JTF commander, and now as he comes in uh, behind, uh, behind Admiral uh, Aquilino as commander uh, in a PACOM, about delivering uh, uh, multiple thousands of attritable autonomous uh, um, systems uh, across domains within 18 to 24 months in order to counter uh, the, the People's Republic of China. Um, that's what Deputy Secretary Hicks announced, and that's what we are uh, doing. It is also about breaking down the systemic barriers across the department to do that um, in, in order to make that capability replicable. So Replicator 1 is about delivering that specific capability, and Replicator is about being able to do that uh, over and over again. Um, so if we zoom out for a second, um, one of the things that sort of that doesn't get as much press as kind of the word replicator, which is kind of a grabby one, um, uh, is that I think is at least as important as something called the Deputies Innovation Steering Group, um, which is co-chaired by the deputy and the and the vice chairman. Um, that is now the third leg of the school of the stool, as the vice chairman talks about it. With so the DMAG that does the budget, the JRA process uh, that does requirements, and now the DISG for innovation. Um, and then the subordinate organization of, or subordinate uh, team of DISG is DIWG, Defense Innovation Working Group, which, which we chair at DIU, but importantly is everybody at the table. So the services are at the table, um, uh, the, uh, the, the combatant commands obviously at the table, the rest of OSD and the joint staff. And that's the organization that's the governance for replicating. And that's critical because it really is about having everybody at the table so that we can uh, get after delivering that capability and breaking down the barriers. So we learn how to do things sometimes in parallel that we're used to doing in serial so that we can move quickly to get them done. So how's it going? Well, we're on track for both those objectives. Um, I still unfortunately can't talk about specific systems publicly, um, although uh, I'm hoping to be able to do a bit more of that soon. Um, but as you mentioned, tranche one of replicators has <coughs> been decided is off to the races um, in execution. The services are all over doing that with support from everybody else in the department now. Um, and we're already working on that second tranche of, in, of systems as well as the <coughs> interlocking capabilities that are critical, um, both hardware and software in order to deliver, uh, deliver capability that actually uh, will work. And, and, and importantly, um, that's not just about the systems and acquisition, but it's also about all the dot mil PF, all the action that's got to happen in order right. for that capability to deliver the effects that's required and do it within uh, in the time frame that is required. Um, you know, the vice chairman was saying the other day that through this process, we've we've uh, we've done in you know the first in the first four or five months of this. Um, gotten to a place, this team has gotten to a place that ordinarily would take three years to get to. Yeah. Um, and, um, and that is fantastic momentum. Um, and, uh, and most importantly, we're through doing that, we are breaking down all kinds of barriers, learning a lot together about how we do this over and over again. Um, the proof, obviously, will be ultimately in the pudding. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and we are on track to deliver. All right. I know she said... Uh uh, Kat Hicks said 18 to 24 months, so we'll be looking for that. That's August uh, 2025, <clears throat> in case anybody was checking. All right, August 2025, you heard it here. So, uh, you know, you mentioned this uh, incredible dot uh, MLPF, uh, and you've got industry out here, and we talked about partnership, partnership with the services, partnership with industry. Could you just take a minute and talk about partnership and why that's important and what you need help with? Yeah, so, I mean, par partnership... Um, Partnership is really at the heart of what DIU is. I mean, our role is to help to build that bridge um, across the world. So I want to maybe spend a moment, since I'm up here with my teammates uh, from, uh, from the Navy, about talking about partnership uh, with the services, because that partnership is absolutely central to DIU 3.0. Um, and, and partnership at every single level. Obviously, we, we're deeply embedded with the combatant commands, so now... Um, uh, so, for example, Aquilino, uh, Admiral Aquilino's Joint Mission Accelerator Directorate, which is driving his major innovative uh, initiatives like the Joint Fires Network. The Deputy Director and Chief Technology Officer for that organization is a DIU embed, uh, oh. my AI tech lead. Um, the um, the S&T lead for the Security Assistance Group <coughs> in Ukraine is a DIU embed. Um, uh, so we're deeply embedded there, but critically, we're, we're deeply partnered with the services at every level. Um, that's about acquisition, um, but it's also about uh, the, the con ops, the comps, the, the dot mill and PF. So it's not just about fielding at scale, but being in a position to employ and deploy, which is why I love the way the Admiral is talking about this, um, so that we are in a position as, as a team 
um, to not only deliver that capability, but to man, train, equip, and sustain it, continually refine and adjust so that we have not just toys, but real capability. Um, and that means partnership at every level. It's partnership with the Secretary of the Navy, with, uh, with Dick Gurton, and, and I'm so excited to have him uh, uh, aboard in his position now, connected at the hip, um, uh, to CNO and BCNO, the Commandant, um, uh, Marine Corps side to the, to the PEOs. My team is super deeply lashed up on every piece that we work on. The Disruptive Capabilities Office, which we partner with very with Michael Stewart and his team very, very closely, to Naval X and MIU, who are yeah. core members of the Defense Information Community Love Enterprises. Naval X. Yeah. Which which we, you know, we are working now as a team so that we can catalyze that team of, of, of entities into a cohesive a team of impact with synergy rather than dissynergy across that team. We just actually opened a joint office all together in Austin. Um, to the Naval Postgraduate School, I see Admiral Rondo uh, out there. She's we'll here. Be, we'll be uh, signing an MOU later this morning, taking our part. Doing a war game with us later on today. There you go. Um, to most <coughs> importantly, maybe um, the dual fluency talent, right? People who speak fluent Navy ease and fluent con commercial tech sector ease. Um, who make up the heart of our team, and so my teammates are sitting right over there. Um, so really that partnership is at the absolute heart of everything we do, because without it, we cannot <coughs> achieve scale of capability that makes a difference and do it with speed. Outstanding. Well, let's shift gears now and go to uh, Matt Sermon. Matt's the Executive Director of PEO Strategic Submarines. In his current role, he provides uh, leadership to the Columbia-class submarine acquisition program and the in-service SSBN and SSGN programs, uh, while also being assigned responsibility for revitalization of the submarine industrial base. And relief is coming, Matt, because I know there's a lot of money flowing into that program. Uh, prior to his civilian service in the Navy, Matt was a surface warfare officer, a nuke. Uh, he received his surface warfare officer qualification on board USS Ramage, DDG-61. Uh, he was also a nuclear engineering officer on USS Dwight D. Eisenhower. Ship's been out there and extended on deployment a couple of times and doing great things. Uh, and that's before he left uniform service in 2004. So Matt, you are uh, the senior civilian in charge of the Columbia class program, the most secure portion of the triad. I say that to all my Air Force friends with pride. Uh, a ship that uh, should be around for 42 years with no midlife refueling overhaul and capable of making 126 strategic deterrent patrols. I did five on USS Mariano G. Baleja back in the early 90s. So uh, Matt, what do you want to tell us about the Columbia class program? Yeah. Uh, th thanks, sir, uh, for the kind introduction and thanks for having me. And uh, thank you to the Navy League for put, putting on the event. Um, this is me answering the Columbia question. Those of you who, who seen me speak before, I always, always, always talk just a little bit of history because we are our history uh, and today is April 9th, uh, 259 years ago today, our civil war ended with surrender at Appomattox. Uh, and it's very tempting to use that as my history note for the day, but I'm not. Uh, I'm gonna answer the Columbia question by saying that a year later, 258 years ago today, on April 9th, 1866, uh, General Grant was arrested for driving his horse and buggy too fast on 14th Street in DC. Um, <laughs> he was also arrested uh, three years later in the run-up to being inaugurated for, again, driving his horse and buggy too fast. It was also in April. Uh, uh, so uh, that's, that's how Columbia is. No, uh, no in all, in all uh, seriousness, um, Columbia leads ships under construction. She's becoming a ship. Modules coming together in heavy outfitting, in electrical outfitting missile compartments in its final strokes uh, before going to Groton. Stern delivered from our Newport News shipbuilders um, uh, late last year, uh, is, is in, in Quonset Point now, being outfitted. Uh, Columbia is becoming a ship. Columbia the ship, Columbia the program. Stable requirements, mature design, production plan built on a heritage of the best submarines in the world. 826 passes the eye test, 827 showing uh, significant improvement in our production trends. Uh, as, as everyone has certainly read, or most of you have probably read, there are lead ship challenges. 
There are, uh, we have had transition uh, to production challenges in, our, in uh, the first ship we've ever designed entirely uh, in a 3D model. We have, have had those challenges. We're documenting and making sure that we pass those on uh, to, to our future selves to not do that again, just like we've passed on stable requirements and mature designs uh, and you know, leveraging what we've learned on Virginia, what we've learned on the uh, perhaps tied for the best platform in the history of the world, the Ohio class, tied with Arleigh Burks, I would say. Sorry, Nimitz folks. Um, we were applying those lessons learned. Um, we are uh, in, in, the, in, the Appomattox, uh, in the Appomattox theme, we're not going to surrender that lead ship schedule. We know we're, we're trending now. We know we we've, we've, uh, don't have the margin we had when we started construction. We we're going to drive to get 826 on patrol. We're going to improve that schedule on 827. And we're going to move towards the 1 plus 2.33 cadence required for the Navy. Outstanding. You know, uh, every uh, August, Center for Maritime Strategy does a uh, Congressional Maritime Intensive Trainer. We have 30 staffers, committee members, young people that want to learn about the Navy. And on the third day, yeah, sounds like Easter, we took them down to HII uh, to see the Columbia manufacturing and absolutely blew them away. And so we're gonna do it again this year. I <coughs> hope uh, you guys will let us come back, but uh, really impressive. So Matt, when I was talking to the other Matt, Matt Zirkel, who works for uh, Circo, Circo, he was my two-star chief of staff in Naples. I said, what's the submarine industrial base all about? And he goes, well, really three pillars, sir. We need 10,000 builders a year for 10 years for 100,000 builders. Uh, we got to fix the supply chain and uh, additive manufacturing, 3D printing. So uh, Matt, you've got this incredible 3D uh, printing facility down in Danville, Virginia. I'm going down to see it. I wanted to try to make it before this, but uh, didn't make it. Lisa Franchetti had her four-star conference. And uh, it's the future of repairs at sea for critical parts. When I was DNS, Phil Cullum, N4, came in my office one day and threw this thing on my desk. I said, what's that, Phil? He always had gadgets and kind of looked like a, a manifold. And he goes, well, that's a fuel injector for an F-18 ENF. And I picked it up, and it was kind of squishy. I go, ah, this would never work. He goes, no, no, the shape is perfect. We just got to get to the materials. And I think that's what you're doing. You're driving, it's like DIU 3.0, you're driving us there. Tell us a little bit about additive manufacturing and then uh, at the five minute point, we're gonna go to questions. Okay. <coughs> um, so additive, metallic additive manufacturing, driving that to scale in the submarine industrial base to help uh, the one plus 2.33 uh, metal forming capacity needed to help with sustainment, uh, to cut cycle times um, by 60 to 90% on parts. Um, what we're doing is uh, rather than what felt two and a half years ago, like additive being everything everywhere all at once, we have narrowed our focus to six critical materials that represent 30,000 parts on submarines uh, ac across the spectrum of platforms. Uh, the, the, it would be easy to just understand what those materials are, but uh, we're laser focused across an academic, applied research, uh, OEM, shipbuilder, and AM specialty industrial base sectors all together, one team. How do we get to the point where when I hit print on those six materials, what comes out of the machine, um, the submarine force, the surface force, uh, we're, we seek to be a rising tide that floats all boats, can be confident in the quality um, of what they're getting. Uh, we are making tremendous progress, uh, partnered with the CO5 technical warrant holders. Uh, we've moved from uh, just being, you know, two years ago, uh, how, how are we ever gonna do that to today having a plan in hand and a part being printed that is a, um, you know, hull integrity casting for a submarine. Yeah. We're gonna prove it out, we're gonna destructively test it, uh, we're gonna cycle it, we're gonna look at fatigue and corrosion, and we're, we're, we're gonna get it right. Um, and the, the, what's really enabled us is that partnership. Uh, we have 10 universities involved and about 30 companies involved. Uh, in the past two years, we've cut uh, our qualification time for companies to be able to, to be NAVC qualified for printing AM uh, from uh, infinity, that's, that, that's a little bit of a joke, but from years, 
uh, down to the, la the last two companies have both qualified in less than six months. Our center of excellence down in Danville has enabled us to really focus on how we bring people into the industrial base, how we build recipes is a term I use. Uh, the, the, more, the more technical material folks uh, use other terms, but I'll use the term recipe for how we print a, a successful part uh, and incredibly excited about that. Uh, you know, we put, put forward in the, in the supplemental a, a, a very large investment in that manufacturing technology space. It also includes uh, automation and welding, automation and machining, uh, robotics. We just qualified our first collaborative robot at a, at a supplier, uh, a Newport News supplier, Newport News and CO5 working together with that supplier. Just got qualified a couple weeks ago. And all those things stack on each other to help uh, not only improve cycle times, but also resolve those uh, workforce challenges. Uh, you know, it's uh, a more, more exciting workforce environment. New collar is, is the, the term we use. Uh, and so, you know, getting um, more energy into that, I would ask, you know, everybody out there from industry, if you're, if you're not having conversations about manufacturing technology and where we're going with additive um, automation, robotics, uh, please, please do engage the SIB team uh, in, in that conversation. Outstanding. And the Navy just brought on its first robotics rating. You all saw probably the robotics dog out here yesterday. Uh, I call it Rex Machina. So uh, pretty cool if you haven't a chance to go play with it. All right, we're going to take some questions from the audience. We have a mic over here and a mic over here. So if you have questions, please go to the mic. And uh, I would emphasize, state your question because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, tell us who you are, state your question. And if you have a particular person you want to ask, then Call that person out, sir. Yes, sir. Rick Easton, retired surface warfare officer. Thanks for the great insight and panel today. Uh, Admiral Caudill, you mentioned requirements in context of the Davidson window, in context of the SLOCs, and to be able to support. Admiral Franchetti talked about 1% increase <coughs> in budget, which is really a declining budget, a theme that's been here. How do we get to what was done prior to World War II? Where have we got to take risk in other places? And what have we got to do again to get to where we were prior to World War II that prepared us to be in much better place from an industrial base? Uh, well, uh, are you talking more in the manufacturing side or in the fleet operations? Well, I think it's both, Admiral. But okay. I would say start with the manufacturing, you know, the context of the workforce and all the things that we yeah. have to do. Okay. And that industry does respond typically to requirements and the funding. So if we minimum fund programs, then we probably don't get nearly as much as we would if we were anticipating. Well, uh, generally, at least from my seat, where I've seen uh, the programs that I came into the job that were not performing that well, like uh, Ready Relevant Learning and some of the IT enterprise uh, uh, programs of record, uh, where I found that when we can get the team together at the table, and have a intermediate progress review process, have a North Star set with a performance to plan canvas that has the kind of the root causes of the impediments clearly defined, and where these conversations are happening in a transparent way to get the rudder back over gently while we, when we come off plan a little bit, uh, instead of letting it drift so far off that now I have to go re-baseline is what I find to be the most satisfying, satisfactory way to go do that. It's transparency, it's accountability, and it's making sure that the roles and responsibilities of the different organizations are clearly defined, and then we hold those to account. And when, they, when you get off track, then they have to come with solutions to get that back on plan. We just have to be aggressive on that, and, uh, and I think that's, that's the winning strategy for that, and I think that, that scales across everything we do. So it's those touch points with the stakeholders in real time. What, you know, in the Navy, we call it CCIRs. I get these, you know, my battle watch commander calls me when there's a, an event that's happened, and then we make a decision. Well, what are the CCIRs, if you will, based on the guardrails we put on programmatics such that I, we get enough early alertment of that uh, so that we can make the course correction? I think far too often, senior leaders are, that are running programs, program managers, want to own it, they're very prideful, and that thing will drift, and they think that they're almost going to get it back on track instead of raising the barriers or preventing execution up echelon and let us bring to bear the full weight of the Navy's department across the solution set. So I think early and more frequent corrections is the key. All right, over Thank here, you, young lady. 
Thank you all uh, for the informative discussion. My name is Nicole Magny. Um, I manage an AUKUS-inspired partnership between Arizona State University, University of New South Wales in Australia, um, and King's College London. Um, so a couple of you have mentioned academia already, but I was hoping um, perhaps Secretary Girton or Mr. Beck could dig in a layer deeper um, on the role you envision for academia moving forward to help get after some of these challenges that you've outlined, um, not only for training the workforce um, of the future, but also in terms of accelerating the capability deployment life cycle through R&D. Thank you. Do you want to go first? I'd like to take a first crack at it. So I don't consider myself an academic so much as I, I worked for um, uh, federally funded research and development center, where the whole point was to um, bring innovation to programs. Um, and then also as a consumer of technology and the chief of naval research have a close uh, coupling with that. So um, we're looking to help uh, find more advanced solution spaces that we can then bring forward into capabilities that we can ramp up and produce at scale. So we have our, our aperture is wide open to take advantage of uh, those innovations coming out of the academic environment and figure out how to drive them into programs such that we can be more successful in delivering capabilities. Uh, Doug, you want to jump on that? Yeah, I, I would just um, maybe build on <coughs> to say, so for us, a, a huge part of uh, what we've got to do is be working very closely with academia to help ensure it's possible for both talent and great companies, um, a lot of whom are actually spawned out of academia, uh, to find an on-ramp into the department. And um, our DIU's got a support organization called the National Security Innovation Network that focuses on doing exactly that. Um, in fact, uh, you know, we've got these new defense innovation on-ramp hubs that we've established in five states. One of them's in Arizona. That's a partnership with ASU and uh, my, my good friend, Chris Howard, who is a former, sorry, Air Force officer. Um, but uh, who's, he's EVP COO of, the, of, of ASU right now. But, um, but there's a massive role to play there, as well as with uh, programs, whether it's Hacking for Defense or all, all the other programs that are out there to help generate the kind of talent that we need to bring into the department or to bring into the tech sector in a way that's going to that's gonna be able to help build that bridge back and forth. So uh, I, I view uh, academia as critical partners, both in talent and in companies, and a huge part of our job is building that on-ramp to help make it possible. Super. Over here, sir. Uh, good morning. Jason Higby, Ambient Trends. Uh, the question of procurement question, um, how, how can procurement of traditionally kinetic platforms and systems better support our future, hopefully non-kinetic needs? Or how can that line bl be blurred from a procurement perspective? So um, one of the things that we want to do is want to, um, as we field weapon systems, we want to make sure they reliably work. Why, why are we shooting those missiles out in the uh, Gulf of Aden? Because they work. And the fleet knows they can re be reliably counted on to deliver kinetic effects. Um, as we look to other kinds of technologies like directed energy, we need to be thinking about how do we make sure that when they get employed, that uh, the warfighter can count on them in you know, the rain and the dust and the humidity that is in the you know, near ocean environment. Um, but we need to also find a way to take advantage of some of the things Matt talked about for how do we do build those capabilities out faster and more effectively so that these weapon system costs can come down. We also want to stabilize our requirement and fund those programs so that industry can figure out, can see that it's going to be valuable to them to invest in their production capacity to order, order to drive down the cost when we have to uh, create these weapons in mass, right? One of the things we're really learning, as if we needed to learn it, but rediscovering is what we're seeing in Ukraine. It's my last job at dot and &E, you know, seeing what was going on in terms of expending energetics on the battlefield, it's a fast moving business. And we need depth in our uh, ordinance in order to be ready when the time comes. If it's time to go kinetic, we're all in and we can marshal the forces we need to deliver effectively and uh, be able to scale it 
to the, uh, the appropriate need. Uh, Admiral, do you wanna jump in on Well, that? I would just say real quickly, I know we're short, is that in any hybrid solution that is marrying kinetic and non-kinetic, autonomous and manned vehicles, needs to start a bit with the endpoint in mind to be designed to solve the key operational problem we need it to solve. So if it's something that we have an unacceptable level of risk in an area, and that's well suited for autonomous, then, then that has to marry up and, and set up and, and tee up our ability to come in later with our, with our kinetic options. So with this, these solutions have to be joined at the hip so that they're not built independently, but as an integrated and seamless application of combat power. Fantastic. We're gonna go ahead and take these last two questions. Gentlemen, I'm gonna ask you to state your question. Uh, we'll go you first, you second, and then the group will answer because we're pressing time here. Sir. Yes, first I'd like to thank the panel for taking questions, a very informative presentation. Um, artificial intelligence has been compared to a fundamental breakthrough on par with electricity and nuclear energy. AI runs on data, and that's the gasoline in the engine. We all know what China has declared. They're going to be the leader in AI by 2030. We know what Putin has said. As an AI developer of an AI system delivering it to the Navy, I'm aware of an acute lack of the right data. For example, are you aware of the there's not a common threat data service within ACS. And I just wonder if you have any recommendations on, or is the Navy addressing that need for the right threat data being available to AI systems, for, to your point, Admiral, for course of action analysis to get out of the defensive mode and to hold the threat at risk. My name's Jerry Spear, go Wolfpack. I'm from North Carolina, <laughs> and uh, thank you again. Thanks, Jerry. So AI, what are we doing? Sir. So Ken Crates for CAMVETS Media. I was at the Keel Lang ceremony, covered it for the uh, District of Columbia up at Quonset Point. Uh, uh, a huge project, huge investment. My question is, is there enough public awareness of a defense project of this size and magnitude and investment of something like the Columbia class coming out? Okay, thanks. Columbia, we'll take AI first. You want to take it, sir? Matt, you want to jump on Columbia? Buildsubmarines.com. Yep, I will. That's exactly where I'm <laughs> headed, sir. So I, 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 uh, my answer to that is, is, is no, right? And, and uh, as many of you have seen, I think, over, over the past uh, year and a half, uh, we, have, we have in what feels a little bit like an awkward role, but it's necessary today uh, to drive awareness of the workforce needs for submarines, the importance of submarines, uh, how, how we drive back uh, attraction to the uh, you know, career enhancing national service uh, kind of jobs we have across trades and engineering. And I think that that has uh, not only had a big impact, you know, 3 million site visits, 175,000 job applications, 17,000 candidate profiles, those kinds of things, uh, including a million uh, site visits in March, but it has driven an awareness of that, hey, we're building submarines and it's really important uh, doesn't dive into the Columbia specifics, and I think there's something to that too, and there, and there is information out there. Uh, but my, my short answer is yes, and we're going to continue to press that. All right, AI, sir. Uh, so um, uh, data is the fuel that goes into the engine, uh, but um, data that is useful to the to the purpose. So AI, artificial intelligence, is not a magic wand. You need to understand the data, at least to the extent that it can be curated and consumed by algorithms. You have to understand um, how the outcome is going to be useful in a war fighting context, but also we need to understand where it can be trusted in a war fighting context, and that means that we have to open up some apertures for collecting information, making sure that it is uh, well curated and useful in machine learning and artificial intelligence context. Anything else you want to add to that, Admiral? No, I would just say at the, at the crux of most of the enterprise IT problems that I deal with, a lack of a really effective data strategy early on was the problem, is we try to collude a lot of legacy systems together. And so those interfaces are complex and they don't naturally do that very well, so the data strategy. And for those out there that are building in the academia data scientists, we need them because that's a thinking thing that we do not have a lot of in our department, I don't think. And I would just say, if you're gonna have a good algorithm, it will only be as good as the training data set that actually trains it. So that training data set, to the point about it being a threat informed, has to be at the highest levels of that. Otherwise, 
there'll be inherent error and bias in the actual algorithm when I want to apply it to the main data set that I'm looking at with the algorithm. So that'll scale classification levels. So the way we handle classified uh, material and information and data from threat sources needs to be thought through as part of the data. Now, the last point is it, this is intensive work. And the Chinese have a lot of manpower, if you will, to throw at the training data set problem. And so we don't necessarily enjoy that. So the work that's going on to build algorithms that actually build the training algorithms without bias is, I think, a fruitful area as well. All right, Doug, last word, AI. Uh, I, I will actually just, just foot stomp uh, what, uh, what my colleagues up here have, uh, have just said. First of all, thank you for asking the question. It's an incredibly important one. Um, uh, data is the high ground. Um, we have an enormous amount of work to do in order to have the right data in place. And, you know, as the Admiral said, uh, AI is one of those words that kind of gets sprinkled around uh, a lot, it's sort of like ma magic fairy pixie dust. Um, and uh, and y that's a mistake. On the other hand, uh, basic machine learning tools done right can make an enormous, enormous difference. For example, there's something we're doing right now with the Navy that's taken uh, the capability uh, to on mine, mine countermeasure un undersea vehicles from uh, six months, what it used to take to update the software on there by pulling the hardware off and I mean the hard drive off and mailing it around and then bringing it back. Basic ML ops tools bring that down to six days, right? Um, with far better capability, but all that resides on on simple data, so that you uh, that's clear and usable, so that you are able to actually get the right data with the right algorithm in the right place to make a difference. This is a problem that the commercial tech sector has been solving for years and years and years. That's why you can go into your app now and look across all the different parts of what your what your uh, your your bank has to offer you. Um, that used to be impossible for them. Um, we've got a lot of work to do to get there, but we're on our way. All right. What a great way to wrap up. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your indulgence today. For my guests, I want to thank them for coming uh, you know, from far away to do this uh, this morning, to have this discussion with you. And I, I want to thank them with one of the highly coveted uh, Center for Maritime Strategy co uh, coins. It's got the Trident for Sea Power, the Book for Knowledge. And I also remind you that this afternoon, Dr. Wills has got his uh, war gaming session. It's going to be tremendous fun. It's probably going to look like the bar scene at Star Wars. And I've got uh, Peter Singer this afternoon for a live podcast. Please join us to talk about Wired for War, Ghost Fleet, uh, Like War, and Burn In, his latest book. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. And gentlemen, thank you. Thank you, sir.